darn yeah. thing off of here. Don't be chewing it up. I, if I'm brush hogging and I see a cedar tree in front of me that I could run over, I don't run over it. I go around it. I'll cut that dude off of the chainsaw. Get it out of there. Because when you chop up a cedar tree, you can see it for three years. It's just a dead area. It's just a dead area. It just kills the soil. So I'm all about growing green blades of grass, not bare soil. So I'm not going to chop up a bunch of cedar. So if he's a little guy, I'll go over it. But if he's that tall, uh-uh. You feel that I way can... about any conifer? Absolutely. Yeah. It's acid. Uh, if you looked, if you go over there and look underneath those great big ones and look under the ground on a, a mature stand where there's just space maybe every 60 feet, there is no grass under there. All there is is dead pine needles. It's killed the soil. Why does it do that? No well, it's, it's evolved that way over the centuries. There's no fuel load under there. So when you have a fire and the fire comes through there, it can't reach up and, and get a hold of the tree. So cedars, cedars have done that in Missouri over centuries that, you know, the cedars kill all the soil. So there's no vegetation growing up into its browse. You get a fire, it'll burn that stuff underneath the, the needles, but it won't get a hot fire up in the cedar. And that's the way the cedar protects itself. Nature has ways of protecting their own. And competition. Mm -hmm. And cut, competition, cut competition, absolutely. Yeah. Nothing will grow there. If you talk to an uh, uh, agroforestry guy, he'll chastise you a little bit about burning them. I get that quite a bit. Yeah, I burn a lot of seed. You should have, well, you know, you can grind that up and there's, there's landscaping companies that'll buy that. If you had a tote and you ground that up and put it in the tote and you can deliver it to a landscaping company, they'll buy that stuff from you. So there is a market for it, but it takes a lot of labor to grind that up. Right. And I have better things to do than stand there and feed a chipper all day. And it takes a lot of cedars to fill up a tote yeah. when you start chipping that stuff. So, yeah, I mean, it is carbon, and I don't like burning things, but sometimes just because of labor and time saving, yeah. But you've got another 120 acres approved here to pull or to get rid of. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, they've got quite a bit of ground down here, and some of their best ground, they got them in those darn stinking ponderosa pine, whatever those, a wabali pine. Okay. Folks, it's, it's 136 acres. 136 acres of, of pine. small pines yeah. that we're going to pull out. Yeah. That's going to open up a lot of grazing. And, you know, they're trying to grow food. You can't grow food in pines. So, I, I think that's a good, that's a good plan. Yeah. That's, that's going to open up a lot of land to you. I do see uh, a little bit of diversity down here, but again, it, it's not, it's, you know, you got to kind of look to find clover. And when you got to look for it, it should be underneath that, all of our feet. Every step you take, you should be in clover. If you're going to get good gains on your steers, it's not here. Um, and that's because, you know, it's just like you said, they've, they've inherited this from an area that it was nuked for 30 years. Um, people grazed it continuously then they hate it and they didn't put anything on it folks you can't continuously take stuff off and not put anything back and people say but Greg it's just grass it's free no it's not free when you remove grass in the form of a hay bale it's just like mining your farm and that's why I am so I am so against haying on my own farm there's hay contractors that's all they do is they bale hay buy it because you bring it and people say, but you're stealing their nutrients. I'm not stealing them. I'm buying them. And when you got to buy hay, it just makes you a whole lot better grazer. And people out here on the land, here, here's the problem with putting up hay. There's lots of problems. I'm going to name one really big one. When you get in a drought and your plants haven't recovered from the previous grazing. And what's and you, recovering? What's the term for recovery? Well, recovery is going back to a plant tip. In other words, it's been grazed off. You go back and measure it 30 days later and the plant hasn't grown one inch. You should do that. If you're first starting out in the spring, wherever you started grazing, drive a wooden stake out there and take a magic marker and write the date on it and the height of that grass. Go back and check that every week. If you're in a drought and you've grazed that off and it hasn't grown back in 30 days any, you need to start selling some animals. You should sell 10% off the bottom get rid of 10 percent of your animals the next thing you need to do is combine your herds if you've got two or three herds get them together quickly if you've got steers get rid of them just don't even think about it just get rid of them you're trying to preserve your farm 
because you're looking at the whole growing season in front of you and it's in June, July, and all of a sudden things aren't growing back. You can't keep your head in the sand. And I tell people, praying, there's nothing wrong with praying, but it's not a good management strategy. <laughs> you have got to plan for what you know. You know the plants aren't growing back, by golly, and you know you can get rid of some animals. That's going to immediately help you. And don't throw all the gates open. I made that mistake my first year. I ever owned cattle. I'm like, heck, I got some more pasture. I'll just give them that too. It'll be better. When you open up the gates to your farm and just let the cow start having all of it, what you have said is, I give up. I give up. I'm done. Because that's what's happened. You are done. The cattle will absolutely strip your entire farm. A recovered plant. Yep. Uh, this is one they're not going to eat very well. It's an old water plant. It's not very palatable, but they should have a minimum of four leaves. This has got one, two, three, four, five. So that one would be safe to graze. Okay. On fescue, uh, you're going to have four. Uh, you'd like to see the plant tips on there. Um, the uh, the thing about drought, so people think that it's going to rain. I used to do it. I'm like, oh, it'll be all right. We're going to get a rain. I'm an optimistic person. It's going to rain. What if it doesn't? In 2012 was probably the worst drought in Missouri, well it was, the worst one measured in Missouri history. Uh, that was also our most profitable year. Did y'all hear that? We didn't get any government assistance, even though it was there, we could have got it. But we just sold the animals when they needed to be sold. Folks, if you sell early, you get a good price. If you wait and think, okay, this drought's gonna get better, the drought's gonna get better, we're gonna get a rain, what happens is the feed supply is shrinking. The supply at the sale barns is exploding and nobody wants your cattle. The price of feed's going up. The price of feed's going up, the price of cattle are going down. Yeah. Don't get in that boat. But here's 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 the other uh, argument I get all the time and it's, I'll tell you what you're gonna hear. Well, but what if I sell 10% of my herd, the, the ones that should have been sold, the, the bad teeth, the bad feet, the long hair, the woolly ones, whatever, and it rains tomorrow. I didn't need to sell them. So what? You can build those back, but you got rid of some that should have went anyway. Um, so it's not the end of the world. You still got your cow herd intact, and it rained. You're going to have more grass. At least you had the, the nerve to, to pull the trigger. Most people won't. Most people just hunker down, and they'll wait for it to rain. And boy, it, it'll kill you, folks. It'll absolutely kill you. So be, be brave. Uh, act early, but you won't know when to act unless you're monitoring. You need to be monitoring the grass behind you. Where you start in the spring, watch that grass. If it's not coming back, you need to do something pretty darn quick. Um, but the, the strongest tool in your, mill, in your toolbox is rest. When you get in a drought, let's say like right now, our last rotation on Judy Farms, we went around all of them in about 35 to 40 days. That first one in the spring, we were at 28. In the drought of 2012, we went 107 days. We were able to go 107 days before we returned to where we started. And we got Hurricane Isaac that fall. It hit um, September September 3rd, Hurricane Isaac. Well, it, it whammed you all down in here, but we got all the rain effect up our way. We got nine inches. We got nine inches in over about three days. It absolutely saved us. You know why it saved us? Because we didn't know graze our farm. We still had residue. It was all brown, but it was about that tall across all of our farms. And instantly overnight, it turned green and it started growing and we had winter stockpile. All my neighbors looked like that because they hadn't destocked any. They don't graze correctly to begin with. And I mean, they were out of feed. And when that rain came, all it did is it just ran off their land down to the creeks and ended up in the Pacific Ocean. So. If you can keep residue on your farm, it's not how much rain you get, it's how much you keep. That's the importance of building a litter bank. If you don't have a litter bank on your farm, shame on you. Open up your grass and look down. There should be some dry stuff laying on top of the ground. That's the future of your farm is the litter bank. So try and get that trampled on the ground. And Ian will go as far, he hates tractors and he hates brush hogs, but he said, if you don't have enough animals, brush hog it. 
brush hog it, but brush hog it high, and that stuff will work its way down with rain and animals grazing on it, you will get a litter bank if you don't have enough animals. It's hard if you don't have a big herd to get or enough animals to get it trampled on the ground. And when do you brush hog? You brush hog in the, when, the, when the plants are still growing. Once the plants get up on a seed head, I like to take about, you know, maybe this much of the plant off, and that gets the stem in the seed head. Don't get down in here. Mm -hmm. So if you're in a brush hog, brush hog it, you know, eight to nine inches up here. And behind the cattle. And behind the cattle, not in front. Um, this farm right here, or this particular paddock, there's some pretty good sheep feed down in here. There's some broad leaves around. The sheep will go after and get these first. Anything that's a broad leaf, that's what the sheep go after. Um, one, here's a sprout. That's a soft maple. Sheep will nail that. They're, uh, I, t I tell people sheep are almost like a glorified goat, mm -hmm. except for they're a whole lot easier to keep in than a goat. Mm -hmm. All these soft maple sprouts, the sheep will just do backflips on them. They really like eating them. Um, we've got it. Well, if I can find it today on my computer, I've got a video of one of our civil pastures that we cleared. We put sheep in there. Folks, when you clear out timber, um, Joyce, you were asking me last night how to start if you had timber or civil pasture. You got to go in there and cut the trees out enough to where you get sunlight down between the trees. There you are <laughs> on the forest floor. But when you do that, you're going to get a, you're going to get an explosion of sprouts. Mm -hmm. What do you do with all the sprouts? You sheep them off. Get sheep in there, and they will absolutely clean every leaf off those sprouts for you. And they'll they'll be building a baby lamb for you while they're doing it. So you don't need Roundup, you don't need Tordon, uh, all this stuff to kill the sprouts. You just need animals. And I wouldn't have told you that 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta kill it. You gotta kill it. Now, because. Yep. Because they have this on the ground here, what do you think about uh, spot application and maybe some chicken litter to burn that up? Absolutely, yeah. It's, it's going to be there probably five years if they don't do something like that. There's not enough nitrogen there to consume, to consume the woody. So yeah, you could get a manure spreader and come down through here or you know, just put down, get a pickup, have, have, a, have a young person just throwing off shovelfuls on each spot that there was a tree. Greg, uh, you're talking yeah, about her. These, <laughs> you're talking about these. <laughs> just oh, her. Okay. You're talking about these conifers here, but like like that dead oak tree there. Yep. And those limbs falling out of it. Let's say they hit the ground and you don't take the time to pick those up. Is there any benefit to the soil from that? Absolutely. Yeah. Chop it up though. Chop it up. Well, let's say that that size right there. You can see how rotted that is already. Yep. That's that's. All I'm saying start. is take a chainsaw and cut it up into firewood lengths. That'll help break it down quicker. Uh, like you are on those hills there and stuff, and you're you're, yep. you're making your silver pasture. You've got a slant there, and you've got fresh ground. Yep. Wouldn't it be better to let some limbs just lay there and catch a little of the, the soil that's washing and stuff? If you look, uh, if you cut down a fresh tree like we're doing, we're cutting down hundreds of them in there. You can't get the livestock in there. I mean, literally, they can't, it's like an impenetrable forest. So you gotta move them off the land. If you don't, you, you we just- put them in piles. Yeah, we put them in piles. We, we have bobcat uh, cover now. We push them out of the silver pasture onto the side where there's still timber we haven't dealt with. And the fence is right on the edge. And we have got bobcats now living in those. I like that. We run sheep and people said, but you want bobcats? I'm like, yep, it's another species. It's just another species. So. Um, I used to burn that stuff. Now, uh, if I see a dead tree, if I don't need the firewood and it falls down, I'll just chop it up in chunks and leave it because it, it's putting a lot of good fungi into your so soil. So I'm saying if that was laying out here on one of those, do <clears throat> you think it would benefit that spot right there? No. No, it, it, I mean, it's not going to break down fast enough. This is pasture. You don't want to put... I, I realize that's a little bit big, but I'm saying if it was yeah. smaller... Yeah. I don't know. Um, it depends what you're doing with it. I mean, if you're just grazing it and you're not brush hogging it, and you know, if this grows up pretty tall and you've got one of those big logs sitting out here in the grass mm -hmm. and you get that to brush hog, there's a $1,000 uh, gearbox gear you just shelled out. I know, I did that. <laughs> My landowner, one of them likes cutting cedars and he likes cutting them about that tall. I found one of them, $2,300 later. 
so I don't let him cut cedars anymore. Um, if you cut a, if you're gonna cut a live tree out of your pasture, folks, get that darn thing down on flush with the ground because when the grasses grow up, and Sam's booking along 12 mile an hour with a big bat wing and he hits that, you just cost this company a whole lot of money. I mean, it's gonna it's gonna break something. So here comes a spade. In this, what's that? Spade. Oh, cool. Uh, let's find an area that's got a little bit better. Can I see it? There's, those roots are down there. Oh gosh, probably six inches. So they've got pretty good percolation. I mean, the, the soil. Yeah, there's not much going on in it. It, it smells kind of. But I, I do like to see the. Let's well, see, there's a worm. So they've got worms down. There's another one. There, there is some soil life in here. So you've got the worms. They're not real healthy looking worms. You like to see big old fat juicy ones, not little skinny guys. But see that 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 that's kind of breaking apart there. Uh, it's got the round. See the little round pebbles there? Mm -hmm. That's good. If it's formed more like a, mold, a putty, like modeling clay, you're not going to get any water infiltration. The water is going to set out here. So this can take up quite a bit of water. This actually smells a little better than the soil yesterday. <clears throat> kind of like cottage cheese curds, like small ones. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like cottage cheese. Exactly. It's got a little better smell to it. Um, Maybe it's because the, you know the, one is the water hasn't set on it. It took the water, or it ran off into the river over there or the creek. Um, but you know, they've got a pretty good stand of fescue in here. So this would be a everybody curses Kentucky 31, but in the winter time, folks, the Kentucky 31 is one of the true sod farmers that you can run cattle on pretty much all winter. I don't care if it rains or snows or whatever, it will kind of hold up a cow. I mean, look at this side. It's kind of like putting a, a landscaping mat out here. Mm -hmm. these, been, these two fields, this field and the field adjoining it, they were still in, this field was still in pine trees all winter. But we strip grazed this field and strip grazed those. We had to cut alleys through our pine trees. Yep. But we carried our entire herd down here most of the winter. Really? Wow. Because it hadn't had cattle on it for a while. Right. The fescue had stockpiled. Right. And we limited uh, still grazing you. them. And Who's got that other clump of grass? I want to put it back. <laughs> if you dig a plug out, folks, uh, remember we're dealing with people's lives down there. Put it back. There's critters in here. If you're around Pat Richardson, um, I got a great story on Pat. I did a workshop with her in uh, Jefferson, Texas. She asked me to bring a chunk of my soil with me to the workshop. Well, I was flying. So I took a, I just ran out in the dark because I had to catch a plane in St. Louis. I dug me a big old swat. I threw it in a zip tie and I zipped it and I threw it on my carry-on. And we got to the security point and they're like, Mr. Judy, you need to come with us. And I'm like, oh crap. <laughs> and I said, come over here, and they're putting their gloves on. I said, what do you got in that bag? And I'm like, soil. Soil? What are you doing with soil? And well, there's grass. And I told him grass. I said, no, there's grass. <laughs> grass! <laughs> I'm like, yeah, grass. And so they're, boy, I mean, there's a whole crowd of them around it now. <laughs> and long story short, they put it through the explosive test, you know, how they do that little paper thing. All oh, this is dirt and grass. I'm like, that's what I told you. <laughs> so they let me go with it. Anyway, I got to Pat's and we opened it up and she had a great big piece of white paper and I dumped it out on the table. And there was spiders, there was amphids flying up in our faces. There was worms going everywhere. And Pat screamed at the top of her lungs. There is life! <laughs> and the spiders are going everywhere and she's grabbing notebook paper and handing it to everybody. She says, grab a spider. <laughs> And you, you literally had to dip the spider up on the paper and run outside to turn it loose. You don't step on a spider around her. She will absolutely go berserk. <laughs> so, Pat's a neat, very passionate lady.
But back to fescue, everybody's cursing it, folks. Keep the animals on your farm that can perform on it, sell the ones that don't, and don't spray your farm with Roundup. Mm -hmm. University of Missouri is leading the nation in that propaganda. Max Q, Max Q, Max Q, Max Q. Who's getting all the money? You know, Rob, he's the head guy down there. He's got over $8 million in grants. From who? Monsanto, uh, all the big seed companies. He's promoting this. And he's the head forage specialist for the whole state. Um, so what do you got to say about this yellow one right here? I don't like it. What is it? Uh, Y'all call it it's buttercup. 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 Folks, this is a sign <laughs> of uh, abuse. Is that the, the same flowers like when we came from Missouri? To, uh, the fields were just covered in yeah. yellow. Yeah, well, there's a there's a wild mustard. We have a wild mustard that puts on a yellow. Is it was it in crop fields? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was in fields. Some of it was. Yeah. yeah. Crop fields are anaerobic. There's no there's no life in there. Uh, no oxygen. And the, the wild mustard just absolutely takes them in the spring. And then they go and spray it with Roundup. Okay. And I they, was trying to figure out what yeah. did they purposely plant these yellow no 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 it's anaerobic soil <coughs> weeds it's just a darn weed mm -hmm. that's the only thing mother nature can put there to grow i'm seeing that for the first time in my pasture buttercup this this year yeah it's not good spring it's a symptom of poor soil uh the folks there's uh, a lot of research done on this that if you increase your stock in density and do an exclu an exclusion zone on it or you beat the stuffing out of it with your herd it's gone it's gone because you're putting down a lot of manure, a lot of urine, and it does not like that. Um, somebody made a mention the other day about the fire ants. You know, we're, we're seeing in Texas, the fire ants, where you're doing a high density grazing, they're not staying in there. They're moving over to the road. Or they're, they're getting in the, uh, the fence rows. They don't like getting a cow hose stomped on them. So that's another advantage of increasing your stocking density. You can drive the fire ants where they're not a problem anymore. Well, uh, Richard, the, that soil life too. I mean, we we treat fire ants by by using by making a compost tea yep. and molasses, which feeds some of that bacteria. And the, that the life in that tea and in that in the, ultimately in the soil um, feeds on the larval stage of those ants, and you don't have them anymore. And they won't even return to that area. A lot of times, they always return to that highest point in the pasture. Yeah. And, and we do that and have great luck for years with them not coming back. What is that called? Is well, just compost team. Look it up. Uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Garrett in Dallas, he does a soil doctor. He's called Soil Doctor. Mm -hmm. He has all these recipes. Um, he's an organic mm -hmm. gardener, farmer, and, and uh, it's good stuff. <coughs> so, we, I mean, we're spraying that anyway on our pastures. and and treat specifically. And sometimes we really want to kill the mound, we use orange extract, orange oil yeah. in there, and that'll kill the existing mound. And, yeah. We used to use that orange uh, compound when I worked in town as a cleaner. Yeah. On, on fiberglass posts. They call it d -lid. Boy, it's strong. It's strong. Yeah. And uh, you want to wear gloves because it's pretty costly on your skin. Just because it's organic, it can still burn your skin. <laughs> but it's not toxic. Um, can we uh, go ahead and, and move over to the steers now? Is that steers on the They're way in the back there. Right. You can see we have a range of ages and weights and, mm -hmm. and breeds in here. But they're all South Pole or South Pole Cross. There's some black, there's some black Angus. There's there are some few. black yeah, Angus. Yeah, low-line black Angus. Okay. Oh, they're low-line black mm -hmm. Angus? There's some really, really, really nice steers in there. Um, so we, we look at this guy here on the far left, the white face. That's just a beautiful animal. Um, you can see his thymus glands on his neck, shining. That little patch right there lower on the neck. That's telling you that all of his internal organs are working really well. Um, he's got a really nice dark streak down the middle of his back. And it looks like you put armor all on him. He doesn't have the fat white in his tail head. He's getting it. Now, and you see when he, that tail comes around the swat at a fly, there's a wrinkle there. Now let's look at this black guy, if he'll come up here a little closer. Um, 
in the, the brisket in between the front legs. You like to see that brisket filled out nice, okay? If the brisket isn't filled out, um, they're, they're, not, they're not ready to butcher as well. This black one, I haven't seen his tail head yet, but he's, he's carrying quite a bit of cover. Um, he's got some good meat on him. And you get over here without him moving. But see, his tail, um, you can still see the vertebrae coming off the top of his tail right there, the bone structure. You shouldn't be able to see that. That needs to be buried in fat. And folks, the tail head, the fat on the tail head, that's one of the last places that the fat is laid down. Okay? But he, he's going to make a really nice steer. I mean, you can tell that. Those black ones look really good. Um, and I'm not a black cow person. But those look good. You know. The gut feels good. What's that? The gut feels good. Yeah, they got good gut feel. Um, oh, the death triangle. If we're going to get nitpicky, I can... This, this black one, when he stands just right, uh, there, on his left side, there's a little bit of a sunken in spot right there. See it? Mm -hmm. See that sunken in spot? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You don't want to see that on a steer. Like when he's breathing, that part is yep. going in. See it? Now? It's going in. That yeah. shouldn't be like that. It's, it's telling you he's not getting enough to eat. Hmm. That means he's not going to finish as fast as he would if that was full. See it? Mm -hmm. It's real easy to see on him. Um, most of these are fairly full. They're, this little guy back here on the back, the white tag right there, that, that red one, yeah. he's got a sunken in spot. Greg, to your right there, that little brown one. Which one? Right, right the brown one. 1803? Yeah. 1803. Right in front. Oh, yeah, yeah, he's sunken in. Yep. That calf is limited. So he's, you know, he's probably only gaining today maybe half a pound. Maybe. Um, folks, and they need to gain what? They need to gain well, on grass. If you got good diverse grass, you should you should be able to average two pounds a day. Hmm. If you drop down below two pounds a day, you're going to have more connective tissue in your ribeye. You're not going to have the fat cover. You're not going to have the intramuscular fat. Folks, people say, "Oh, you don't want fat on your meat." Yes, you do. There's no flavor on a lean piece of meat. That's why grass-fed beef has got a bad name. Everybody says it tastes like a shoe sole. Well, if you butcher and it doesn't have any fat on it, that's kind of what you're chewing on. It might be tender, but it doesn't have any flavor. It's the grass fat that has all the health benefits as well. But folks, these, these, these steers are built right. They've got the, the nice fine bone. They, they all got pretty darn good hair coats. Yeah, there's a few that's got some rough hair. But I'll, I'll warn you on that. It's always the younger ones are always going to be later shedding off. If you've got an older one like this guy and he hasn't shed off yet, this calf probably has some parasites in it or something, or something going on with him. He's a little larger frame, so maybe there's not enough energy here in the grass for him to even shed off. But the younger ones, the smaller ones, they are shedding off. Here's a calf that's severely limited right here in front of us, right here. This little one looking at uh, 5318. That calf is skinny. Look at the death triangle on this side. I mean, it is sunken in like a cereal bowl. I mean, he's awful. That, that calf is doing awful. Even though he's slick, he's not putting on any weight. What's your comment on the two Charlotte looking ones there? How are they competing with, this, with these other animals? The, the question was how the two Charlotte ones competing. I can't see the other one. <laughs> this one doesn't look too bad. I mean, he's got good-looking thymus gland on him. He's got a nice brisket on the front. He's going to make a pretty good animal. He looks fine. He doesn't have a death No, he looks fine. Folks, when you move cattle, when you move cattle, you open the gate, and the cattle come rushing through the gate and immediately throw their head down and start eating. That's a red flag. Did y'all hear that? When you open the gate and the cows get up and like, really, you want us to move again? <laughs> really? All right, I guess we will. And they come walking through and they'll walk clear to the end of the paddock, wherever that is. Then they put their heads down and start grazing back. That's what you want to see. But if you open that gate and they come charging through and they stick their head down like they're starving to death, you should have moved them sooner. So they're telling you. I told you yesterday, if you'll watch your cows, they'll tell you what they need. 
that one's telling you he needs to be moved. But unfortunately, there's not a really good high energy paddock to put him on, but he can really use some extra groceries right now. Um, this one just pulled off a blackberry vine. That's not normal for cows. So if they're grazing blackberries, by God, they need to be moved. What about the tree limbs there? Tree limbs, I see that. Even a, a really fat cow is fed well, they'll reach up and grab them a tree leaf. And especially mulberries. They love mulberry leaves. Um, soft maple, they don't eat sycamore very well. They don't eat sycamore leaves. That calf there must have been a bucket calf. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that is a tame calf. <laughs> Folks, if you're in the contract grazing business and you're bringing in steers, that's the calf that's worth a million dollars right there. I had one, we named him Ears. And uh, he came in with a group of calves. And he came up and stuck his head in my bucket because I was trying to train him to follow a bucket. And all the calves are wild as March hares. This one came up and stuck his head in the bucket. And he had big old long ears on him. I called the owner and said, I want to buy your steer. And he goes, that's the crappiest steer in the whole bunch. <laughs> I'm like, I don't care. He said, well, you'll never get your money back. I'm like, I don't care. So we bought him, and ears grew up to be 2,000 pounds. He was part Brahma, big old long ears on him. And that steer, when we got in new steers, all of the little baby steers, the 400 pounders, they adopted steers as daddy. And you could go out there on day one with a brand new group, 300 steers, and go, come on, let's go, ears. And he'd grab them steers, and here you go. And they would all follow him to the water, and they'd follow him into the new paddy. What's that worth? A lot mm -hmm. of money. We kept ears for probably five years. And uh, he finally got so big that he was tearing our pastures up. And I told Jan, I said, you know, it is the business. And I had to be more hardcore. Jan was balling. But we you, had to sell him. Because you yeah. named him, right? What's that? You yeah. named, yeah. named him. Yeah, we named him. I mean, the dang steer would come up and he was like a dog. He'd lean into you the more you rubbed his ears, <laughs> all right? Um, yeah, it was tough. I didn't teach him to ride. I think I could have. <laughs> I could have got on him and rode him. I mean, he was yeah. that tame. But um, anyway, uh, a, a lead steer is a great thing to have. Gordon Hazard, the old guy in Mississippi, he had one a lug. He called him Oug, and Oug got up to 3,000 pounds. But he'd use Oug to load pots. Those steers would follow that big old steer into the loading area, and then he would walk back to the back, and they'd load that pot load. He'd bring him back and get another pot load. Hmm. And that keeps the stress off your animals. If you're going to butcher one, uh, we don't get all of our animals up. We take a piece of poly wire. If you had a piece, I would show you how we do it. But you basically, let's just say we wanted that Charlay steer right there walking away from it. We would go in there with a piece of pie where we'd sort him and another one and find a fence line over here and we'd walk those back to the corral. You don't get up your whole herd. Let them, let them keep grazing. Just take one, but always take a buddy with him. Even if you come out and you see a heifer that's been trying to calve for an hour, there's no progress. The feet are still in the same position. Don't take that heifer to the corral by herself. Bring another cow with her. Once you get the heifer in the crown, you can let the other cow go back to the herd. But if you try and bring that heifer by herself with a pellet wire, she's going to freak out. Because they are herd animals. What does it mean, Greg? You got, you got a little heifer in there. We got seven in here. Okay. What's that? I noticed that, that little bucket calf a while ago that had creases down its rump. What's, is, is that a sign of anything? I'm not like, sure like, what you're talking about on the creases. On the heifers, uh, coming from the vulva down to the udder, there's an area there, the wider that is, they call it the astuchion. The wider that area is, it looks like mole hair. The wider that is going down to the udder, the higher butter fat that she's going to have for her calf and her milk. If you got a little narrow astuchion on a cow, it's not good. Look at the udder on the cow. She's got six teeth. That's phenomenal. So you got four that gives milk, and you got the two fakes on the back. That's a good sign. It just shows you that she's a high butter fat. She's got a lot more butter fat. Folks, here's the problem with our cows today. We've got them producing so much milk that the baby calves get full before they ever get to the butter fat. The butter fat's at the very end. So they got to suck that teat completely dry before they get the cream. 
Well, if a cow's giving a lot of milk, and Junior gets full, he's like, I'm done, Mom. He never gets to the milk. He never gets to the cream. A good, dairy, a good beef cow should give about 250 pounds of butter fat during, during that full lactation with that calf. And if a calf gets butter fat, folks, those are the herd changers. Those are the guys that fill out in the girls and make excellent replacement animals. It's butter fat. It's not fluid milk. Mm -hmm. See, they're taking it down. They're not touching that. Why not? Because it's been fouled. It doesn't have any energy in it. How long does that last? It lasts a long time until you brush hog it off and get it trampled on the rim, let new stuff grow up through it. Folks, this is a good tip. When you can reach out with your hand and snap it off. That was a lot of work. You can't ask a cow to do that. They're doing it with their tongue. They need to really reach out there in one pass. Just bite it off. Okay? A cow can only take 40,000 bites a day. Did y'all hear that? 40,000 bites a day. And so when they get to 40,000, they can still be hungry. They can't take another bite. That's it. Is that Pearl Mint? That is Pearl Mint. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's the poison one. Ours looks different. Ours does too. Oh, yeah, that's, that's definitely mm -hmm. Now that'll kill sheep um, if they get a good diet of it. I had a lady freaked out uh, last year. She called me, said my sheep are dropping. And uh, she had Perilla Mint. And uh, she wasn't moving the sheep. And so the sheep had ate all the edible plants, and all she had left was Perilla Mint. Mm -hmm. The sheep ate it, and they were dropping. So she's after the sprayer spraying the Perilla Mint instead of moving the sheep. <laughs> But back to the grazing, a cow takes her tongue, you want her to be able to reach out and get a mouthful with each tongue full so that she fills up quicker. She lays down in the shade or out here in the sun and ruminates. She ruminates. She breaks that material down. She gets up, uh, poops, and goes back and does it again. And she may not have to take 40,000 bites. She may only have to take 20,000. So a, big, a cow doesn't bite grass off. They use the tongue. They rip it. That's what that big old rough coarse tongue is about. They're pulling it into their mouth at lightning speed. And I've seen cows go up to a really succulent plant. I'm like, man, she's going to nail that one. She's going right toward it. And her tongue will come out. It'll go around that succulent plant. And it'll grab the plant on the back side of it. That lightning speed. She just walks past it. I'm like, what the heck? It wasn't any good. It didn't have as high energy as the plant right behind it. Hmm. Folks, there's cows have been grazing for however long you believe the world's been here. They, the cats, how long they've been grazing, okay? And uh, they've adapted. They can do it at lightning speed. And there's actually a symbiosis going on between the grazing animal and the plant. Have you all heard of the compound on the end of the nose called smooze? Um, there was an article written in, uh, oh gosh, Graves, the Graves magazine. And the title of the article was Smooze, S-M-O-O-Z-E. It's a mucus. And what it is, it's a, it's a steroid that makes the grass come screaming back. Hmm. So the cow reaches down to graze, she leaves a little smooze on the end of the plant. Oh. And the plant's like, ah, oh, thank you. <laughs> And, it's, and it grows back. So it's that symbiosis between the grazing animals and the grass. And Greg, wow. so um, when you get that tug, what's happening with that plant underneath? Yes. So when you, people say, but I got my hay field. And I want to mow that. Well, go ahead and mow it. But look at the area you graze versus your hay field. The grazed area will always beat the mowed area back in regrowth. And because of the pulling action of the tongue, when the tongue reaches out and yanks on that grass, it transfers that energy down the stalk of the grass into the roots. There are billions of little microbes living on those root hairs. And all of a sudden, they feel that tug. And they're all like, <laughs> they all get woken up, and they all start eating each other and, and transferring food back to the plant to replenish that top. When a sickle bar comes across, there's no pulling action. It just chops it off, so you don't get that tugging action. And also, with a, a machine, you're not getting the animal impact, the treading. You're not getting any fertilizer. And so a, a grazed pasture will beat a clipped pasture back every time in regrowth. And I didn't finish my talk 
about the, the droughts. When you have 40% of your farm withheld from grazing, because that's your sacred hay field, <coughs> that kills you in your drought period. So if you've got a hay field, it's usually going to be your best land, because that's the easiest part to get the machinery over. But Greg, I can't graze it. Why? Well, I don't have any water. Okay, that's not an excuse. Put water in there. Or build the lane temporary. Let them walk back to your general farm to get a drink. Well, I don't have any fence. Sorry, that's not an excuse either. Get some poly wire. Put a poly wire around it. But get that darn hay field into a paddy. I even took the lanes out of our farms. I used to have a lane that was the full length of Judy Farm. It was about 20 feet wide. It was kind of handy. It hooked onto all of our paddocks. So if I had a cow in a paddock that I wanted to butcher or a steer, I could walk her and a buddy over to that lane and just walk them to the crowd. Well, there's one problem with the lane. It doesn't get grazed very well. Now we'd turn cows in there and kind of let them chew on it. But when I took that lane out, my gosh, it turned into a paddock. And now it's got diversity in it, where before it just had one monoculture, it was fescue. Look underneath your fence where there's no animal traffic you're not going to find much going on underneath that fence water. Uh, we can go into our lifetime lease farm. There's still broom sedge underneath that fence where I put that fence in 20 some years ago. When we run animals, there's not a semblance of broom sedge anywhere. It's gone. So it's animal hooves. It is a cloven hoof, folks. It's doing this. Every time it steps down, it's doing that. It's spreading open. And that's a massage. It's massaging the ground. And it's, it's exposing little pieces of bare ground, breaking down carbon. And, and allowing for new plants to come up. It's a wonderful symbiosis. Well, what do you know about, I'm in Southeast Texas and we have sandy soils and like yep. almost monoculture of bahia. Yep. Um, I mean, and one of my concerns is just the lack of diversity. And, yes. And, yeah. It's tough. Sand is the hardest thing there is to build organic matter into. Yeah. Because it just chews it up. Yeah. Um, the only way you can get uh, organic matter started in there is you got, got to bring it in. Yeah. If you can't grow it, you got to bring in bales and start feeding on that. And getting off of it, extremely high density, short duration, and gone. Yeah, put a lot of animals yep. in. Gone. Yeah. And keep doing that across your landscape. But if you do that treatment, don't continuously do it all day long. Right. You'll hurt your animals. But. What well, hurt them? Um, the performance. Yeah. It's going to drop. Yeah. Uh, anytime you put animals in real tight, even if they've got a lot of feed in there, it's, it's, it's not normal. Yeah. Uh, they don't like that, and it stresses them. They need to, they need to have a place to go lay down and yeah. chill out. Yeah. Folks, I love going into my cows after they've filled up. Sometimes they'll, they'll be laying down, you're like, oh, gosh, dang, that was dead. <laughs> you ever done that? Mm -hmm. I mean, they just laid out. <laughs> I'm like, crap, that cow ain't moving. I don't see her sides moving. She's dead. <laughs> you walk up, and she's like, what are you doing? You woke me up. That <laughs> gave me a heart attack. <laughs> yeah. I got a question, Greg. I've got a, a farm lease and there's 40 acres set aside, never been sprayed, always hayed. And I was wanting to bring livestock in there, but you know, I've got him to where we just cut it once. You know, around July 4th, yep. let it go to seed because yep. he always want to take another. Right. We'll do it on chairs. What if we go ahead and cut it because he's got four horses he's needing to feed? And then maybe when it goes to seed head, bring some cattle across there quick. Yep. I mean, it's never been sprayed or fertilized. Yep. He inherited the farm and he's wanting to keep. Right. So I just need to talk him into letting me. Absolutely. I don't want his horses in there because so, it'll, it'll be bare ground. A lot of people, I get this on uh, YouTube a lot. People say, well, you just put the cattle in there. Now are you going to stockpile that? Well, that makes some good stockpile for this winter. I'm like, what are you talking? You know, no, I'm going to graze it again, probably two or three more times. Folks, you can't just graze it in the spring and then use that as your stockpile that winter. That plant needs to be grazed because if it grows all summer long and you let it get up there mature and another 45 days before killing frost, you've really lowered the palatability of that plant. Hmm. If you don't have enough animals, uh, I would even say in July, go out there. If you don't have enough to get over the whole farm, you got too much land and not enough cows, clip it. It needs to be... It needs to be regrown fresh in the fall. It'll make it a whole lot better stockpile. Now, I have lease farms that haven't been grazed for 30 years. I brought cows in. Now, this is custom grazed. And uh, the guy's like, you're going to need some hay? I'm like, not for a while. But you've got to bring me some licks. <coughs> so they bring in protein tubs. 
And those cows, I'd pretty much winter them on that whole farm. And they were eating nasty old dead grass that had been there, and they were doing great on it, as long as they had a tub to get their protein from. So you can do that, but if you're doing grass-fed beef, of course, you start giving them a tub that's got grain in it, that's not, you can't really do that. But uh, be careful, if it's an old plant, and it's grown in the spring, you try and graze it that winter, it's not going to have very good feed value. And your animals are not going to gain very long. So they may not even gain, they might actually lose weight. Yeah. Hey, Greg, that's about, about time. Okay, I was wondering, I was yep, looking. Nope, you're right on track. All right, guys, let's.